As Joe said, I'm David Gertzel, Senior Editor at Media Post. We have a great panel today. Um, as they said, I'll, I'll start to introduce them so we can move along. Uh, Toby Gabriner, uh, President of Adapt.TV. Uh, he was formerly the President of Kara's Interactive Division in the U.S., working with clients such as Pfizer and Adidas. To my immediate left, Eric Franchi, co-founder of the digital media company Undertone, which uh, I guess you've been running spots recently on The Pitch, which is the AMC show, it's sort of a reality competition among ad agencies, right? That's correct. Okay. Uh, I, you know, it comes after Mad Men, so it's uh, supposed to uh, sort of dovetail with that, I suppose, right? Yep. Okay, I got that. I, I, one interesting uh, thing about his company, uh, back in March, uh, they uh, launched, I, they kind of went car dealer, right, and did sort of a money-back guarantee. So uh, if, you, uh, the, if, if an advertiser didn't get the required brand lift, uh, you got your money back up to $50,000. So uh, Flash Gordon, uh, better known as Adam Gordon, uh, third uh, from my uh, left, Senior Vice President of Sales for The Guardian in the US. Uh, it's the venerable newspaper that's becoming a multi-platform brand, already is, I suppose. Um, so why is he on a video panel? Well, um, let's see. I guess four words might describe it. The first two would be Rupert Murdoch and the second Royal Wedding because as they increasingly uh, offer video alongside their news coverage, uh, I think uh, you had a banner year last year, right? You had the Rupert Murdoch video with the pie in the face, which is still up. If you Google it, highly recommend it. It gets funnier every time. And uh, the Royal Wedding probably well, helped. We broke it. the entire story. Broke the that entire was just, story. That was just one teeny thing. Oh, okay. You know, the whole phone hacking story is Guardian investigated, sure. so researched it for years, it's been you know, fought really since. hard to break that editorial. And so. it's still moving forward, uh, so I'm sure it's driving lots of traffic. As of a half hour ago, yeah. Oh, I yeah. missed that. Uh, and and uh, a sub-site, if, if I will, if I may, is Media Guardian, which uh, is, is great, and I, I recommend that. Yes. Okay. And then Donald Williams, uh, Chief Digital Officer at Horizon Media working with clients such as The Caveman. I guess it's just Geico, really, right? Okay, The Caveman doesn't show up at the office, right? And uh, The History Channel, I can't wait for The Hatfields and McCoys, so uh, that's a series coming up, so uh, look forward to that. So um, I'll throw this out there. Uh, I'm not sure I see the downside of an RTB marketplace for online video, TV, or anything else. Uh, on the web, there's so much inventory that a seller can benefit from an opportunity to sell it efficiently while a buyer gets some transparency and less paperwork. I suppose with overnight TV, there's a lot of remnant inventory as well. So help me out. Where are the downsides, if any? Do you want to start? I, I don't think it's necessarily a, a, a downside, right? I think you pointed to the positives of it. I think the reality is you spoke to it from a very uh, display advertising centric uh, point of view, right? Because there is lots of availability with display. RTV is certainly um, having a, a positive effect in many cases for display. But with video, um, you have the opposite, right? There's scarcity with video, particularly premium video, particularly um, TV network quality, right? If you think about a three-tiered marketplace, there's the NBC, ABC, CBS is, excuse me, there's the, the Hulus and, and the YouTubes, right, where there's lots of scale, and then there's, there, there's the rest of it at the bottom from a reach perspective. Um, th that stuff at the top, it's scarce. That's why it's sold on an upfront basis. That's why um, the phone calls go to the publishers, right? And um, there's not necessarily the need to really invest in or investigate RTB just from the scarcity perspective. Banners, whole other story. I would actually say there's a lot of upside for some publishers because you get to put your inventory out there, you get to set your, your rate, and let the marketplace, you know, raise that rate by bidding. So, As the publisher on the panel, yeah. give us a sense of the scale of which you use RTB. RTB is one of many sales channels we use. Um, you know, it's, it's my job and our team's job to make every possible penny for our brand, to keep our brand in existence forever. Um, you know, for us, RTV, video for RTV is much different than display. Um, frankly, we see as high or higher rates in RTV than in the direct sales funnel. So for us specifically, I don't see a big downside. Um, I, I think that the conversation actually should be even at a higher level. And in our opinion, RTB is more the tip of the spear um, as it pertains to uh, programmatic overall. Um, and 
Um, you know, the programmatic discussion, unfortunately, has been very focused around just real-time bidding, um, but it's really also about how can we make it a lot easier for buyers and sellers to transact with one another using technology. And, you know, obviously the easiest way right now is through RTB, but um, I think over the next year or so, we'll start to see more tools that enable programmatic even in committed environments, um, not just simply in uh, real-time bidding that around audiences. And, and I appreciate it. It's rare that you hear the publisher say, yes, I'm all for uh, uh, RTB. Typically what you hear is more like what Eric was saying, which is like, well, you know what, with video, we're sold out or it's premium. Um, RTB tends to have the connotation of being, you know, remnant um, and uh, the dregs, so to speak, and for those who are trying to do like hardcore audience targeting and things of that nature. So going back to what I started with, I think we need to elevate the conversation about there's a new way to buy and sell. One of the ways is doing it through RTB, but uh, RTB, I think, is just demonstrating that technology can connect buyers and sellers in a much more automated, easy uh, fashion. I'm going to jump in just quickly. I, and I think, Toby, that, that kind of preamble until you got to that point is, is what the, the only negative thing is in, in, um, from my view. And it wasn't a, it wasn't a poor preamble. I thought it was very articulate. Um, I just think we, the negative connotation, right, it, it immediately discredits the actual opportunity for buyers. This is a marketplace that represents tons and tons of volume specific to video. Um, that, that scale discussion, though it, though it, there's tons of value there. It becomes an obstacle in certain discussions depending on who the advertiser is, right? I think brand marketers at large look at these types of opportunities on the video side and say, hey, that's automatically not premium. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't want to participate in that type of an experience or that type of a purchase process. And, and that been for us, our, you know, our organization, which you know, focuses on a com composite that leans largely toward brand advertising, we have to knock down those, those walls on a consistent basis. Let me follow up on that. Uh, it's been touched on a little bit. So you mentioned Hulu and, and NBC and, and such. So, you know, there's the argument if you're at the top of the food chain, you know, why do I do RTB? It might commoditize my inventory. It might cut down on the relationships with agencies and buyers. But isn't there room for both? Um, and you might be able to answer that because, you know, if I'm dealing with NBC and, and your agency and your digital team and your TV team, you all get together, um, you know, can't you do the multi-platform deal with NBC sort of on one track and still work with them on less coveted inventory through the RTB? Um, yeah, you can. And, and, and again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even qualify it as less coveted inventory from a buyer's standpoint. I think maybe that's a seller's perspective. Um, we're, we're, the reason why we originally engaged in a strategic partnership actually with Toby and, and his organization is because the pressure of video dynamics across the board were pushing us out of what is termed premium environments, or at least it certainly pushed our interest outside of those categories. Now, all, all I view... Um, marketplaces that, that trade video as is a solution that provides us with a broader perspective so that we can, you, you know, we can more favorably negotiate rates. Anything else that you layer on top of that, whether it be data or performance, those are great insights that allow us to make better decisions. But the idea is really just to evaluate another supply source, put pressure in other ways, kind of bring down costs, make things more favorable for clients. Jump in. One, one, yeah. one other thing. Um, to say on that around Hulu and, and other premium brands is that, um, and I think I heard in some of the earlier uh, conversations about this uh, notion of a private exchanges or private marketplaces, which um, as a, you know, what Adapt TV does is actually provide a uh, platform that connects buyers and sellers. And on the seller side, one of the big areas that we've seen um, a lot of interest from uh, the premium sellers is around this notion of private marketplaces, which allow them to sell their inventory in a programmatic way, still have the relationships with, uh, in fact, you know, some of them will, uh, uh, you know, develop and do all of the relationship uh, outside of the marketplace, um, have some sort of overarching deal with an, uh, an agency like Horizon that covers off on a lot of their brands. And in some respects, it actually can be advantageous because it can uh, enable the seller to be able to touch a lot more campaigns than they may not uh, have in the past when they were trying to sell into every single account on every single campaign. It can be a larger deal. 
Um, so I think we'll start to see more of the premium brands going down the path of, of having these kind of private marketplaces where, again, the inventory is, is bought and sold in a more automated way, but they still have a relationship uh, directly with uh, the buyer. Eric, how does that affect where you sit in the ecosystem? It's fine. It's fine. Yeah, I mean, it, a private marketplace is, is an efficient way to buy media. We support it. We would potentially use it as a tool to, to buy or sell. Um, again, from my perspective, and, and I think Undertone's perspective, because we work with you know, the most premium of the premium from a, from a publisher perspective, it's so early on for video. It, it, it's, it, it's potentially too early to even be having that conversation as it relates to video. Again, for, for that subset at the, at, at the very top. I think there's like a ton of opportunity as you go down the pyramid, and I think it's like automating and providing scale and efficiencies everywhere across the board. But again, when, when you're thinking about premium, and I, and I think with video, that's for better, for worse, what the association is on the client side, um, it's, it's a very early conversation because the, scale, the, the, the true scale just isn't there. Right. And I think it's a dynamic that we're, t we're trying to take advantage of, actually. And hopefully, you know, hopefully it will work, right? I think, I think most people in here believe that uh, digital video will continue to grow fairly rapidly. And, um, and again, in the spirit of just creating more favorable marketplaces or more favorable dynamics for our clients, getting out ahead of it, you know, and, and purchasing, whether there's a ton of volume or not, actually, it probably plays better to buyers, right? Because then hopefully I can have a greater impact on cost at a lower, you know, lower overall investment. Um, but that, but we're, you know, we're, and, and was listening in on the mobile uh, discussion before, we were very much um, trying to push our clients towards moving what, a, what would seem to be rel relatively large investments into immature marketplaces in advance of, you know, more competition because it creates better dynamics. I guess I'll make this a toss-up. Who benefits most from an RTV, RTV video market? Uh, brand advertisers or direct response advertisers? And has there been a notably different adoption rate between the two? And let's, I guess, say, has that evolved? Because if we were having this conversation a year ago, it may have been a lot different, all right? All direct response a year ago. I think. All, all direct response. A year ago. Yeah. That's who leapt in first. Yeah. yeah. But I, I don't think it's about a category direct response or branding benefiting. I think it's about you know what clients are taking advantage of an early adopter position. It's it's really no different you know than upfront versus scatter, right? It's a client that gets an early laser money in is about buying an audience. They're going to get probably a more efficient rate. Um, and then that's the indirect relationship between the brand, the publisher, and the client. But then the, the client and the publisher still needs to interact on program-specific, i.e. scatter buys that are targeted to specific campaigns. Well, you know what I think it's interesting about that question is it, it, it's coming from a place of that RTB is strictly for direct response and, and that audience buying is all about direct response. Actually, if you think about the way that television is bought, it's all about audience, yeah. right? And um, the movement that Nielsen is making into uh, online video with um, their online campaign ratings, and soon they'll have their cross-platform campaign ratings, and they're making, that's all about measuring audience, right? So if anything, I would argue, and by the way, all the numbers bear it out uh, in our businesses, is that we only work with brands, um, and we're you know growing very rapidly. Um, and the, I think, probably 70% of the campaigns that run through our platform, maybe more, are using audience data um, for the, exactly the reason I described. Sure. The video, video is skewed for, for brands from, from the start, right? That, that's who's going to buy it. Is that, is that true? Yeah. Okay. Largely. Largely. Okay. Yeah. That, I would agree as well. I mean, I, I think it's a, it poses a more uh, interesting uh, opportunity for a broader spectrum of marketers, but tends to gravitate to these solutions tend to gravitate toward brand advertisers because they're video based, and that's where a lot of the you know that's where a lot of the experiences already takes place. The reason I asked you, and I, I'm sure I'm missing something, but direct response advertisers using online video, it, it would seem there's a great opportunity there for for direct clicks off the video to e-commerce type situations. I think they're far fewer than in traditional yeah. display. I mean, traditional display, they can, they can interact with the creative, the banner, the unit in sure. 8,500 different ways, where the video is just 
click here or click you know the, the companion ad. So right. I actually don't think it's made for direct response. Yeah. Okay. Our RTB was birthed, and you know the, the the acceleration in terms of adoption was by direct response advertisers on banners, right? And it's still largely the the domain of that. Um, just vi video inherently is different, okay. right? It's a branding vehicle. Can I just? I'm going to keep hammering this point. We we get confused. We're using RTB to connote direct response methodology. It's not. It's just a different way to buy inventory. Um, and I think that we as an industry have to clear that up. Um, you know, even you'll see the agency trading desks now are starting to move into doing a lot more brand based activity. They buy a lot from exchanges. They use RTB, but they're being held to brand metrics, brand engagement. Um, you know, brand lift, all these sorts of things. So. I really think we just got to take off the table. RTB is just, it's a way to buy inventory. It's not direct response. Okay. Uh, a trouble spot, potentially. Peace of mind, something I guess we all uh, grapple with. Uh, can, can the buy side uh, rest assured uh, they know what they're getting in an RTB market? Or does sort of that Wild West dynamic of... Uh, of online video come into play. Uh, I think Flash has some uh, take on that. Oh, you want me to comment on that? If you want. <laughs> um, uh, I think one of the benefits of intermediaries that step in in programmatic buying is they can QC the, the publishing brands that they're placing media on behalf of clients and brands. Um, that's, that's why we often will have unblind um, access to our inventory so they could see our URL, see the quality of, of inventory, see that it is not just Rupert Murdoch getting a pie in the face. It's about, you know, real news that's happening across the world. Um, Are you saying that's not real news? Other real news. How's that? <laughs> other real news. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I don't, I, I don't think there's a, I think there are always going to be shady characters in, you know, any marketplace, and I think that there are ups and downs in it. I don't think that it's any more or less prone to pitfalls and valleys. Yeah. And that's, that, that's what we need. We, we, we need the transparency um, for RTV video to, to grow, if, if it is to grow, because um, there were some, I, I mean, the marketplace shot itself in the foot yet again um, when, uh, when, when this stuff really started growing with, um, with the, the lack of transparency and buyers thinking they were getting premium quality click-to-play video and getting something that was much different, right. getting something that maybe was never viewed, um, that was a big story. That was that was in media posts. That was in lots of publications a couple of years ago, right? And, and I think, unfortunately, there, there's a, there's a lot of good solutions being developed, right? Adam's talking about selling in a transparent manner, in a, in a controlled, private, transparent manner, and um, I, and I think there there needs to be, unfortunately, a lot of education, a lot of undoing of some of the of some of the stuff that was done in the beginning that, that you know, got buyers very nervous. But here's, here's the big rub about the transparent environment that we live in. Um, I, I have a bit of a soapbox, as I sense you do, um, about the access that an advertiser has to metrics on a publisher's site, where if they're buying, we have to be transparent because we believe in that. If an agency is buying an audience, or advertisers buying an audience, and they're looking for specific metrics of that audience, why does the advertiser need to see specific metrics about a publishing brand? And that's where I think it gets a little dicey with video, because video is such a higher CPM unit than a 728 by 90, that in essence, you could have advertisers um, inappropriately directing inventory to publishers that maybe they should be buying outside of RTB. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. Okay, uh, you? do you sleep well at night as far as knowing uh, where everything should be? I, the, you know, the, the, um, the sales channel conflict that I think created some of the lack of transparency yesterday has been resolved really effectively. We don't deal with tools that don't provide at least domain level information, right? And then you typically sub-channel information as well. And even if publishers feel like um, those who are, who are potentially trying to take advantage of things like RTB and get, you know, liquidate at some short order, they have the option to actually take away transparency or, or limit information and a buyer has equal amounts of control to kind of gravitate toward that or not. I, I, I personally don't view what we're doing as being, um, 
uh, as being somehow uh, mystical and or non-transparent. Um, I think if anything, uh, it would be great to be able to knock down some of the educational hurdles, like you said. I, I, clients don't, you know, I don't think every single client is, is as familiar with what it means to be 100% transparency. Oftentimes people think, hey, that's, that's placement level information. I should be able to go to page two or I should be able to go to college basketball wherever and see my ad right now. And, and the, the, those conversations still exist. But, but in terms of just transparency and buying, we're, we're kind of already there. Tub? Any thoughts? I, I would just simply say this is not an RTB issue. This is, in fact, RTB, in theory, if it's implemented correctly, provides way more transparency than you get in a lot of places where you get aggregated inventory. Um, and I think Donnie hit the nail on the head, which is, is that as an, an industry, I mean, we just have to do a good job of, of policing all these things. Same way display went down a rat hole, and there was all kinds of nefarious activity that's going on. I'm sure all of you guys saw the latest Comscore report that 31% of uh, impressions are unseen by a human being. Um, that, you know, think about Ridiculous. that. Ridiculous. Yeah, think about it. You're paying a 30% premium uh, on impressions. Anybody it's who's lower than what we see across the campaigns where we track viewability. Right. Yeah. So that where I was going with this is like, I think the next huge wave of activity that's going to go on, and we're certainly, uh, we're slightly orthogonal to RTB discussion, but is this notion of viewability. Got to happen. Okay. Um, Not a very contentious panel at this point. We're all heading in the same direction. We'll try to stir it up. Um, <laughs> so uh, explain to us, Donnie, uh, your involvement at your place as sort of an agency trading desk. And then I guess I'll toss it up. Is there the potential for agency trading desks at, I guess, even bigger agencies, agency slash holding companies to have sort of too much power in this marketplace? Um, I'll, I'll start with, uh, you know, our perspective, our, yeah. our general perspective. Um, you know, and, and, and this conversation has kind of unfolded over the course of the day, so I, I, uh, I, don't, I don't mean to be redundant, but someone was alluding to the costs that are necessary in order to invest in certain solutions, including technologies that would enable a, a trading desk. Um, you know, Horizon's a different type of an organization than most of these companies. We're, we're independently owned. Um, you know, our president and CEO is, is, the, is the owner of our organization. We've grown really rapidly, and we've done so by making certain financial investments and also pulling back and withdrawing in certain ways. Uh, our client right now, or I'm sorry, our company right now couldn't sustain its own trading desk. Um, I, you know, and, and that may be evolving very rapidly, but, but as it stands, it never became a primary focus for us. Now there's other aspects of that model that have, have been surfaced as, as potentially uh, damaging, not only to the organizations, but their clients as well, and, it, and it's kind of unfolded, and, and a lot of it's driven by transparency and incremental fees and, and whatever. Um, but we really had a focus on developing technology relationships that would get us to where we thought the market was going versus realize, you know, added fruit or added margin on top of a market. In many ways, in my mind, that's, that's kind of dissipating, and that would be the display marketplace, you know, for, for a number of different reasons as well. So we, so we kind of said, hey, you know, we need to have an integration that allows us access to Facebook, and we need to have an integration that gives us access to premium video, and those are the two areas that we focused on, and they're, and they're not technologies that we derive. There's better people out there, including Adapt TV, that, that we can tap into, so that's kind of the direction we've headed in. That's a nice compliment. Yes, Donnie's a, uh, they've been a, a wonderful partner of ours for a while. Um, the... So this is an interesting question. I, I actually come out of the agency world, um, and a big reason why I left was because of the uh, lack of momentum around using technologies like um, uh, DSPs and things of that nature. I actually left uh, the agency to go run X plus one, ironically, which is one of the uh, uh, leading DSPs. Um, the, I, in my opinion, the the launch of the trading desk within uh, the holding companies has been one of the better um, developments uh, within agencies in a while. I, I think that they're all struggling to figure out how it's going to play out ultimately, um, and there's certainly some, you know, potential conflict of interest and, and things of that nature. But the notion that that agencies are now have a division that's focused around leveraging technology um, and figuring out how to to be more efficient in how they operate. Um, 
I, I promise you the, the cost of managing campaigns, uh, acquiring inventory, doing all of that within a trading desk is significantly lower than uh, the, the general accounts that happen in agencies. Now, the charter for the trading desk has been much more DR focused, going back all the way to, you know, again, RTB is uh, 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 all about DR. But I, I think that what's going to be interesting is, is that over the next couple of years, you'll start to see the ad ops group um, who have more and more pressure to start figuring out how to leverage interesting technologies on their campaigns and the trading desk groups starting to have uh, come to loggerheads about sort of who has the power around technology within agencies. And I saw you raising your microphone too, so go ahead. I'm just going to jump in. This is, a, this is actually fascinating. You guys having a great time? This is a fascinating <laughs> topic right here. Um, it, the, I, I couldn't agree more with the, the um, comment around operational costs, I think that the idea that our organizations collectively have to get more effective in determining where to spend dollars is, is brilliant. I do take a step back at this point in time and wonder out aloud whether or not there are some soft costs associated with uh, current agency trading that we don't like to talk about quite as much and, and just some that come to mind are retention of talent, right? I think there's a number of people that I meet with on a daily basis who go, yeah, you know, what we were doing over there might have been a little bit odd. Operationally, you know, we, you know, we, we kind of had a, a firm directive, right? It's something like that. Um, I also think, you know, more interestingly perhaps, people's inability to evaluate multiple solutions. One of the things that's interesting about our field is that there's om almost an infinite amount of opportunities to take advantage of on behalf of your clients. I think when you start to try to limit that, you cause as much confusion as you do resolve confusion. So, I, you know, I, I, there's, there are very simple business dynamics that, are, that, it w that you could point to and say, hey, this is, a, this is already a success. There are organizations that are doing tremendous. There are clients who are benefiting. But I think there are some other dynamics that, that people need to be aware of as well. Right. Bring it back to video for a second, please. Um, any publishers here besides Adam? Raise your hand. The power for, you asked about power specifically, right? I like, did. like do trading desks wield too much power? That's a, that's a whole other conversation. Specific to online video, specific to premium publishers, right, with the marketplace being what it is, and there being more demand than supply in general, you guys have the power. Remember it. I set my rates. Exactly. You set a floor, too. Yeah. yeah that's what I'm no, saying. it yeah. seems right. That's what you said. Um, and so they're high. We, it is TV upfront <laughs> week. Um, we won't nego Do you want to negotiate in public? No, okay. But, so, but, um, you know, so can we get this whole notion of power to me kind of, I think it's interesting. I think to a tier three, tier four publisher who doesn't have quality co content and a quality audience, yes, they don't have as much power as an agency. And I think that if you're a quality brand with quality content and quality audience, I think there's equal power between the agency, the buyer, the client, and the publisher. Because in theory, you have strong content, a strong audience. We've communicated that to our clients, and they will place a premium on it because it works. If I am schlock.com or schlocky videos of people making paper planes, yeah, maybe the agency can, you know, set a, a lower price or just not buy the inventory. Are you buying that, schlock.com? <laughs> I'm not, uh, not right now. <laughs> nah, I, don't, I don't think so. Send an email after this. Uh, the, the one, the, uh, I, I also wonder this from a buyer's standpoint. I'd love to hear your perspective because I don't know what the answer is. I, a lot of what people try to create from a buying standpoint, of course, certainly our organization is this notion of premium, right? There, there are definitely content associations that you want to create, but then, you know, fair premiums, right, mm -hmm. for the content. And I think uh, what's interesting about some of these platforms potentially is that you can say, hey, schlock.com, one, two, and three, and they're and oftentimes not schlocky, but for the purposes of this example, well, I, I realize that if I purchase and or negotiate my media around a, a completion rate, I can see the, you know, equivalent lifts in brand metrics that maybe as I would if I spent a, you know, a premium CPM to have, have placement. And I think, you know, frankly, that type of information is really critical both for you guys and also for buyers as well in order to kind of level set the marketplace, right? So we're not just paying premiums because 
Why because you based on the audience is what, what I'm saying is if a publisher, it's kind of if you build it, they will come. If there's a quality brand with quality content, in theory, you're going to reach a quality audience. So, you know, the whole this whole notion is about buying an audience so that if I am delivering, as we are at The Guardian, upscale, younger than most news demographics, um, techno savvy, yada, 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 and that fits the exact uh, requisite of what the audience is that your advertiser is looking for, they'll pay a premium because it fits perfectly. But would, it, but would an advertiser pay more for an audience or would they pay more for a dis, uh, an audience that's distributed but is responding favorably to the client messaging? Like I think what, it's both and I think uh, that's the whole benefit of programmatic buying is you can evaluate on the fly what's working, what's not working. And maybe say, you know what, this publisher's premium is a little too high so we're going to step out. And then there's someone that's maybe a little bit less prestigious, and maybe they do have a better completion rate, yada, yada, yada. So we'll spend Would you listen there. to that negotiation if I said to you, hey, listen, I'm seeing some traction over here at $7, and your pricing's at $12, whatever your pricing's at? That's different than programmatic buying. That's, I think, more a direct relationship where I'd say, okay, how much more money are you going to give me? And then I'll lower my prices for you. <laughs> right? Fair enough. Right. Um, so uh, we're going to get to questions in one minute, but all of you either directly now through working in an agency or uh, through friends, connections, previous experience, have, have some insight into the, how the TV buying operations work. It's upfront week. So uh, it would seem that clearly the media sellers most opposed to an RTB style process are the TV networks. Uh, so give me your take. Will they ever come around and move aggressively into that space? No time soon. Anyone? I'm not sure I follow. Could you, will, will the TV networks ever put their broadcast spots oh, on, on, on a they, All right, let, let, I'll, I'll qualify. Yeah. Okay. Um, they don't have to. They're, they're moving no so much inventory tied to the upfront. Um, there's high demand for that inventory throughout the year. You're, you're talking to, to entities that are setting premium pricing and getting it. Um, but there could, are, could, there, could there be a situation where they yeah. can peel off a percentage? Do what Adam's doing, set some floors, just right. see, just see sure. and go from there. Right. Absolutely, but you're talking about a marketplace that's just so hot right now for premium pubs. There is a lot of overnight inventory, uh, and you know these cable networks have a lot of hours to fill. So, you know th there is that potential. Yeah, a Adam's maybe. a perfect use case, right? right. If if he's got uh, a, a secondary channel monetization strategy in place that can allow him when somebody gets hit with a pie or Kim Kardashian gets something thrown at her, right. fake anthrax or something right. like that, capitalize that on that with, with with you know partners that can be down the chain. That's a perfect use use case, but that's a different it's, it's type of publisher. It's very different, I think, the broadcast brands because they know their entire departments exactly. on pricing and planning, and they know exactly where all their inventory they is. Yeah, where, you know, it's, when it's one is in the news subject. business, it, it is. It's a different business. news is happening on the fly, and, right. you know, there's some editorial that does and doesn't have video in it, and some of the video that gets put into editorial is quite compelling and then goes viral, and then you have that extra inventory. So why not, again, as I started by saying, it's my job to make as much money as possible to fuel my brand. Toby, it doesn't sound like you're going to launch a oh, business no, in that space. Yeah. Yeah. And then we'll, and we do need to move uh, to questions. Um, I, I would say that the, the buying process that gets leveraged across like programmatic environments is viable for, for broadcast and cable networks as well. And I think what we're doing right now in early stages, I guess, is creating that momentum, right? So if you start to see dollars move disproportionately toward online video or whatever, you are absolutely gonna see a bit more of an aggressive sales approach from other media supply channels. I don't, you know, and again, the, the, the upfront probably isn't the best way to think about it because that's a, it's kind of a, a legacy. I think it's really the scatter market and yeah. the recessionary type market, like yeah. the fourth quarter even I last think, year was I think kind it'd be of kind of badass for an, a, a, a network to put five spots out in the market and see what kooky crazy people will bid millions of dollars yeah. to put how about try and make their daughter the next Kim Kardashian because there are people out there that will do that. How, right. about, or, one, how about one Super Bowl spot next you know, February? Right, or um, an agency to go, hey, network, I've got X amount of dollars. Sure. I'd like, this is what I want. Are you up for it or not? Let's get some questions. Yeah, if, if I could follow up on, on that question in particular, I mean, television inventory isn't just the upfront. It's not even just the broadcast networks. In fact, they have now digital tier channels. There's a lot of unsold inventory in television. 
but we don't talk about that part of the business. But from Donnie's point of view as a buyer, isn't it more efficient? And let's talk about spot TV and all those tiny little markets out there that hundreds of spot buyers have to process. If all the logic we've been talking about all day long makes sense from programmatic trading point of view, why wouldn't it make sense to start doing television that way? There have been attempts with Google TV and Spot Runner and Navic and other platforms, and they haven't taken off because the television industry does a great job of convincing people that they're perishable and they only have a finite supply. But to agencies and to consumers, is it that distinguishable? But there, there's another thing at play here when it comes to television, and we haven't talked about this at all, like just the dynamics in video. Um, we have to remember that audiences are fragmenting at a, an inordinately fast pace, right? Um, uh, recently, there was a, a study that came out that showed the millennial generation is spending half its time watching TV, video, outside of the box in their living room, right? So where I'm going with this is that 80% of the impressions today go to about 20% of the audience. One of the biggest problems facing agencies today is how do I flatten out my frequency quintiles um, such that you know I'm hitting light uh, TV watchers in other areas where they're watching television, right? Um, so I'm not sure, like, yes, there's this huge remnant issue uh, in cable, but uh, I don't know if you're, if, you know, Simul Media, for instance, is actually trying to solve this problem. They're trying to take a lot of the, the unsold inventory, um, and they're doing that within television. Even with broadcast network television as defined by Nielsen, about, I don't know, 25% or 30% of all impressions go to long tail networks that aren't even measured by Nielsen right now. If you just threw that inventory into the into the schema, you'd have that many more impressions. And all the reach analyses I've ever seen is when you do some peel back of network broadcast, put those dollars into um, you know, cable or other reaches, you actually build more efficient reach. But the point is um, they've convinced the market that that's the only way you can buy it. So why wouldn't it make sense? I think what you, you guys are probably, or certainly, Toby, you guys and you guys both, are, you're talking about dynamics that aren't being considered as it relates to the prevention of this type of thing happening. I don't believe, I think all it would take is one successful entry into the market in, a, in whatever manner necessary from a, a reverse auction perspective. And then, a, you know, a buyer to see, hey, look, I'm buying at 40% of what I've purchased in Scatter Marketplace in the past. And I think you'd, you'd have success. Wait, right. You know, I think there is... You know, I, I, and, and of course, perhaps it wouldn't be the best use of dollars given some of the audience fragmentation, but it certainly would be a proof case where people would reconsider the, the viability of the product. And, it, and frankly, there are a lot of organizations that are working on this already, uh, ours included. I mean, this is, the, the, the more you can create these types of dynamics, again, the, the better off your advertisers will be at the end of the day. Yeah, I actually, uh, that's a really important point, and I uh, jumped into another area. I mean, your point is valid insofar as is that um, the way in which that a lot of scatter is bought today could use some of the dynamics that we're starting to introduce in digital. I a thousand percent agree with you. I don't expect them to put the Super Bowl up there, but right. um, no, exactly. you know, a Adam doesn't put yeah. his big scoops up right. on the RTB market either, right? right? And the networks that you talk about, all the ones that aren't tracked by Nielsen, are the lowest hanging fruit to start moving in this direction. Yeah, I think overnight spots and ovation, no offense. Um, let's get a question from the audience. Hey guys, so uh, speaking specifically about connected TV and not necessarily online video, uh, as smart TVs become more abundant in the U.S. market, uh, the manufacturer becomes a bigger player in advertising. Uh, so I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on how uh, LG, Sony, Samsung, and, huge, and Panasonic and big players like that who are actually providing the connectivity um, kind of have to work now with the networks and uh, any early thoughts on what that looks like. Uh, well, I, 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 here, here's an interesting stat. We just did a survey recently uh, amongst about 300 uh, digital buyers, not even TV buyers, digital buyers. And 28% uh, of them said that they're already starting to buy in connected TV environments, and another like 20% said that they are looking to start doing that, which I was really surprised at. Um, so it tells you that that's definitely a growing area. I, you know, the, the, it, I think 
I, I don't have a, a crystal ball on this, but it's going to be fascinating to see how it plays out with, you have the cable companies that are trying to uh, make sure that they don't lose uh, control over the ad dollars. You have the networks that are freaking out about the TV everywhere and what that means. Um, now you've got the manufacturers who used to just be the dumb box coming in and saying, hey, we want a piece of the pie, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, I, you know, it'll be, and recently, I think it was Samsung announced that they actually have a, an ad network for connected TV. Um, so clearly, you know, everybody wants a piece of that $200, $300 million global uh, television. And billion. there's, what's that? Billion, right? Uh, sorry, billion. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I think you're going to start to see a lot more of, uh, because of the, the smart device thing, the device makers starting to get into this. It'll be interesting to see the reaction of the content and cable guys and how they react to all yeah. this. It's been I think it's a stretch to think that the, these, that the TV makers become media companies, though. Right. right? I, 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 I can't see, see that. at all. Yeah. They don't have the infrastructure or the culture. To do it. Yeah. But, but think about how razor thin their margins are on those right. boxes. Yeah. I mean, I'm they could so start sure giving the, the boxes case. away yeah. uh, if they can get more advertising Yeah, they, they want to. The question is, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, think they? Mobile wow. is a good example of that where there are, are manufacturers um, who try to, to yeah. be a media company and they're struggling, right? right. Yeah, I, I think I'm that's... I'm not saying they're going to be successful. I'm just saying if when your margins are this big and... and why not try? Why yeah. not yeah. try? Yeah. Right. I, I, yeah. I would agree with all that stuff. Plus, we haven't seen, uh, I mean, there are connected devices in existence prior to the hardware manufacturers, and we haven't seen a boon of, of sales just yet. And I think, um, and certainly the opportunity is a bit smaller, but uh, it's, it's interesting a lot. Uh, and I think, I believe I know you, or at least I've met you in your media buyer, right? Okay, so you've probably talked to, you've probably talked to folks who have sold connected device inventory in the past, and a lot of what they say is, hey, I'm not exactly sure what we have here, but I'd love to get you love to get you some of it. And I think sometimes, right now, in the digital space at least, that type of a sales approach isn't, isn't quite, as, quite as effective as others. We uh, are done. It's been a great panel. Thanks, guys. I suspect you'll each stick around for a few minutes. If there are more questions, we didn't get a chance to uh, field. Is there one more? OK. Hi, thanks, David. Good panel. Uh, Kelly Wenzel with Undertone. Hi, Eric. Um, my question is actually not for you, it's for Donnie. Um, Horizon, you, you've been leading the way with the viewable impression, which you guys touched on earlier. You had some nice press this week. And I'm curious, do you see this extending to online video? I know the technology is mostly for display now, but could you talk a little bit about what you think that will mean for, uh, for online video? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so if anyone didn't see uh, the... The, or, and I'm sure a number of you didn't. Uh, if anyone didn't see the, the uh, article that she's referencing, it was a, it's a deal that we're working on with ESPN right now around purchasing only viewable inventory in the display space. And we're leveraging RealView's technology. We've worked with them for a long time. Um, you know, in our, in our world right now, we view in-stream video uh, as viewable. It's a, it's a bit of a crude solution, but... Um, but it's, be, it's a technology kind of uh, workaround for us in the short term. Uh, a lot of the success that we're seeing in the video buying uh, side actually drove us toward viewability as a, as a solution or a solve for display media. Um, certainly there are some issues with that. You know, in player, of course, is, is what I'm talking about, and certainly things like audio initiation aren't, aren't gonna fly. But, but uh, if you find select, p uh, select um, media supply that allows for engagement that basically creates viewability and or you purchase on things like completion rates, uh, you can start to lock in and, and drive those, um, drive your viewability up without, uh, without kind of a technology verification solution. And that's, that's what we've been doing. Now, you know, think, you know, again, we work very closely with DAPTV, we work closely with others. You'll see as we purchase video and, and again, the, like kind of in-stream video, uh, we're purchasing around these parameters that help to create less risk in terms of viewability. I, I hope that answers Can your I question. just have a final word on that? It is a major issue. It's, it's becoming bigger and bigger. Um, and a uh, little two-second infomercial, we have a big announcement coming in a few weeks uh, related to exactly this issue. Uh, call us at Media oh, Post on. for the exclusive. Announce it now. Announce yeah, it now. or please announce it now. Flash, I understand there's some breaking news with David Cameron not liking the Euro, so I'm going to run out and watch video. <laughs> Go um, thanks again. Um, and I appreciate you guys participating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.